Good morning, and welcome to the third and virtual annual general meeting. My name is Anne Perpiesman. By way of introduction, I have been involved with the college as a board member since 2015. I'm currently serving my second year as the board's president and chair. I am a specialist in internal medicine and endocrinology and metabolism, and have been practicing for more than 25 years in New Westminster. I would like to begin by acknowledging that this annual general meeting is being chaired on the unceded and traditional territories of the Coast Salish peoples, including the Squamish, the Tsleil-Waututh, and the Musqueam nations whose historical relationships with these lands continue to this day. I also acknowledge that all of you attending today remotely are located on territories of First Nations across this great province. Participating with me today during these proceedings are Dr. Heidi Otter, Registrar and CEO, Mr. Graham Kirstead, Chief Legal Counsel and Deputy Register of Legal, and Mr. Mike Epp, Chief Operating Officer. I will now call the 2022 general meeting to order. I declare that we have a quorum of registrants in virtual attendance and that we are duly constituted for the transaction of our business today, which includes adoption of the minutes for the annual general meeting on September 24th, 2021 presentation of the board approved audited financial statements for the period ending February 28, 2022, appointment of the auditors for the current fiscal year, an in memoriam for registrants who passed away during the fiscal year March 1, 2021 to February 28, 2022, my president's report, and other business and questions from registrants after which we will conclude this annual general meeting. For those of you joining by video, if you have a question during the proceedings, please use the Q&A feature found on the ribbon at the bottom of your screen. You can ask questions at any time. and We will answer them when we get to other business. I will now ask for a motion to adopt the minutes from last year's annual general meeting held on Friday, September 24th, 2021, as published on the college website. I will invite you to all cast your vote by selecting one option on your screen and clicking submit. Here are the results. 85% have approved the minutes. The audited financial statements for the year ending February 28, 2022 have been approved by the board and have been published on the college website. Just as a reminder, if you have a question about the audited financial statements, Please use the Q&A feature found on the ribbon at the bottom of your screen. We will answer when we get to other business. At the time the agenda and motions for the annual general meeting were sent, the college was in a year two of a five-year contract to engage PricewaterhouseCoopers as auditors for the college finances. Since that time, PricewaterhouseCoopers has advised the college that they are no longer providing audit services for the not-for-profit sector. The college has been working with the firm KPMG for the annual audit for many years. With the sudden loss of PricewaterhouseCoopers, the college approached KPMG to determine if they would be prepared to conduct the annual audit. This matter was reviewed by the college's finance and audit committee at its September meeting and also at the college board meeting. 
I present to you the amended motion asking you to, to appoint the firm KPMG LLP as auditors for the current fiscal year. I invite you all to cast your vote by selecting one option on your screen and clicking submit. Here are the results. 97% have approved the appointment of the auditors KPMG LLP. I will now ask for a moment of silence to remember and pay respect to registrants who passed away during the last fiscal year between March 1st, 2021 and February 28th, 2022. Thank you. I want to begin by recognizing and commending the unwavering commitment of college registrants to care for their patients during the COVID-19 pandemic and acknowledge that the medical profession has been stretched thin during this unprecedented time. I also want to acknowledge that we are facing a critical access issue when it comes to primary care. And I know that family practitioners are doing their best to provide that care to their patients. Finding a quick win to this complex situation is not easy and it will require the input of many organizations and governments across jurisdictions. I'll speak more about this shortly. And of course, we are acutely aware of the opioid crisis 
continuing to rage in BC and across Canada, which has had a devastating impact on so many patients and their families. This reality requires us to pause and reflect, to consider our priorities and remember what is most important to us as medical professionals caring for our patients and also as individuals with friends and family, all of whom are affected in some way by the world in which we are living. Thank you for your continued resilience. Against this complex backdrop, the statutory obligations of the regulator do not cease, and patient care remains the foundation of the work that we all do. For the college, this means being mindful of our role in ensuring the public is receiving safe, competent care from registrants. We continue to register and license qualified physicians to respond to patient complaints and take the appropriate action, to administer quality assurance and accreditation programs, and to develop standards to ensure professionalism in medical practice. But the college's right touch approach to regulations means that we are proportionate in how we conduct our business. Right touch regulation means we intervene when necessary and the steps we take to address a situation are appropriate to the risk posed. We are consistent in our approach and our decisions Rules and standards are aligned and fair. We are transparent and accountable, and the actions we take are justified and can withstand public scrutiny. And finally, we are agile. We know that the world around us is rapidly changing. Our responsibility is to anticipate that change, identify and mitigate new risks, and adapt our focus as necessary to meet the expectation of our modernized duties and a shifting healthcare system. Right touch regulation encourages a collegial relationship with registrants based on mutual respect and trust. It also requires changing behavior through remediation and education rather than the use of a regulatory lever. This is a right touch approach that we strongly endorse and see as being more effective and proportionate in many circumstances. The college is in the middle of a review to identify opportunities to make the complaints process more accessible to indigenous peoples. The goal of the review is to develop a future state of the complaints process that addresses the recommendations from the Dr. Mary Ellen Terpel Lafont in plain sight report and includes pathways for indigenous peoples to have their complaints addressed in a way that is culturally safe and appropriate. As an organization that strives to use knowledge as a tool for creating change, this review is a critical step for the college to undertake in acknowledging our colonial past and demonstrating our steadfast commitment to truth and reconciliation. At an operational level, the review will shed light on how we can break down barriers and encourage indigenous peoples to bring forward concerns about their care and identify opportunities for the process to be better informed through a lens of cultural safety and humility. While the regulator's role in health human resourcing is limited, we are deeply concerned that one in five British Columbians lives without access to a primary care provider. And we continue to leverage every licensing mechanism available to us within the parameters of our current legislative framework. We continue to have discussions with our provincial and national partners to identify opportunities to expedite registration for applicants who meet eligibility criteria. And we support a robust mechanism for movement within Canada to address growing demands. We have also introduced a new associate physician class of registration to allow practitioners with some medical training to work under supervision 
in acute care settings to increase capacity and service delivery. Increasing the supply of physicians, creating more opportunities for international medical graduates, and addressing health system needs are not problems that can be solved easily with short-term solutions. They require innovative and coordinated systems-based responses. The college is keen to be involved in these discussions and looks forward to working towards long-lasting solutions. I would like to focus now on the development of practice standards, which is a statutory requirement of the college under the Health Professions Act. We acknowledge that the volume of new or revised, revised practice standards over the past three years has increased compared to other years. And some registrants have expressed concerns that adhering to expectations contained in college standards has placed undue pressure on their already busy lives. Many of the revisions to existing standards or the introduction of new standards these past two years came about because of the pandemic, which brought to light several important patient care matters that needed to be addressed immediately. While all practice standards are reviewed on a four-year cycle to ensure they remain current and relevant, the social landscape is not always predictable which makes it difficult to determine when a just-in-time regulatory response may be required. Standards address issues such as social justice, health equity, and patient care. These issues are identified through our complaints process from other jurisdictions, from public interest issues in the media, or from government reports on health system matters. Standards are drafted with input from registrants through a voluntary consultation process. We appreciate hearing from you and value your feedback. A registrant's compliance with college standards inevitably reduces the risk of an interaction being brought to us as a complaint. To that end, the college expects registrants to use and trust their own professional judgment in applying standards in their practice and to seek out necessary supports to arrive at a solution and plan of action. Over the next two years, we will be increasing our efforts to make our standards more accessible and to support registrants in applying them through use of online learning courses and other interactive resources. You can watch for an announcement shortly about the launch of the first series on, of online courses, addressing three practice standards that frequently elicit questions. The times we are in may be extraordinary, but if the past year is any indication, I believe we have developed a collective resilience to overcome whatever uncertainty awaits us. The health system is undergoing unprecedented changes and we have a tremendous opportunity to work together with our provincial and national partners to shape the future together. Thank you for being with us today. That concludes my report. I will now open the floor to any other business or questions, but just as a reminder, if you do have a question, please use the Q&A feature found on the ribbon at the bottom of your screen. And Susan Prince is gonna help moderate the questions. Yes, good morning and thank you, Anne. We have uh, just, just two questions. Um, they're both fairly long and so I'll just uh, read them out as they've come in and, uh, and you or Dr. Otter can uh, identify the appropriate person to answer. In the event that a registrant at the college wishes to raise a concern about the contact, conduct of another registrant, does the college offer any kind of whistleblower protection or support for registrants who might otherwise be targeted as a result of raising these concerns? I'm referring to instances that fall outside of the legally mandated cases where registrants are obliged to report. Sorry, Susan, audiovisual problems. Um, could you please repeat the question? I'll repeat the question. In the event that a registrant of the college wishes to raise concerns about the conduct of another registrant, does the college offer any kind of whistleblower protection 
or support for registrants who might otherwise be targeted as a result of raising their concerns and specifically referring to instances that fall outside of the legally mandated cases where registrants are obliged to report. Thank you. That That is a very good question. And I, and I do appreciate that um, collateral um, um, bullying and things like that are deeply distressing to hear if they are occurring within the profession. Um, I, I would be, um, our, our existing legislative framework is what we have. Uh, we don't have good whistleblower protections. And in fact, we've identified this as a critical area to government that needs to be addressed within the Health Professions Act. I will invite Mr. Uh, Kirstead to just to talk about principles of administrative fairness that come in play uh, when there is an allegation, uh, one, one physician against another. Graham? Uh, thank you, Heidi. Um, in an instance where uh, one uh, registrant complains in relation to another, and, and you've correctly identified uh, that Dr. Robson, that there are instances where there is a statutory immunity and that does deal with duties to report. Now, I think you can look at the duty to report. It does. It is pretty comprehensive if you believe that the continued practice of another registrant is a danger to the public. Uh, then uh, that would be under section 32.2. And then the section 32.5 and statutory immunity uh, would be there as a form of whistleblower protection. Uh, it only uh, shields a reporter uh, from an action for damages. It does not uh, shield anyone from a cross complaint or something that you would see as being, you know, perhaps based in retaliation for having made the complaint. Uh, and as Heidi has said, that is a gap that we're aware of and have requested that government uh, plug with a newly reformed legislation that we're anticipating to have at some point. Um, administrative fairness, of course, is you know if you make a complaint about someone, they are going to have an opportunity to respond. Uh, and that's as pretty much what it comes down to. You have to be able to know um, the complaint to be met and be given the opportunity to be heard. Um, both sides being heard is really one of the uh, principally uh, fundamental parts of an administrative, uh, administratively fair process. Thank you. And uh, the second question is, um, BC compared to most other provinces seems to make it impossible for physicians to observe a clinical setting. This means that we can't show our clinical spaces or equipment or innovations to interested physicians. How can we hire them if they're not allowed to even see how our clinical care occurs without a BC medical license? Um, yes, yeah, thank you for that. And a lot of this ties back to the requirements put upon the college under the Health Professions Act. <clears throat> and in particular requirement that we have to administer the criminal record check before you can be at point of care anywhere within the healthcare system. So we do have a visitor class of registration to permit people to come in and observe the healthcare system. And again, I would encourage anybody who's thinking about having coming, somebody come in and be in the visitor class of registration to contact uh, registration at cpsbc.ca so that we could um, uh, discuss those opportunities with you. Thank you, Dr. Otter. Those are the only two questions we currently have in the Q&A uh, chat function. Uh, maybe we'll just give folks another minute or so. If you do have a question, please do type it to us. If you think of a question after, you are, of course, always welcome to contact us and we will answer your question that way. Um, are there any other questions for our panel today? Dr. Priestman, Dr. Otter, I'm not seeing any further questions coming in, so I will uh, turn it back to you. Thank you, Susan. Um, we will now con conclude the 2022 annual general meeting and thank all of you for joining us at this virtual meeting today. The minutes from this meeting will be posted on the college website. Have a good day and please continue to stay healthy and safe. Thank you.